So now we're starting out um, on a segment entitled Vibrant Portland, of course. Um, and it's talking about our thriving downtown, our creative economy, and the role of tourism in our economy. And uh, we're going to have all three of our speakers, and I'm just going to introduce them all right now and let them flow uh, one to the other. We have Casey Gilbert. Casey is down there. Way, yay. Okay. Executive Director of Portland Downtown. Uh, a comment that a vibrant downtown is essential to the city's economic health. I think she would agree, probably, on that one. Um, and then we have Lynn Tillotson. Did I say it correctly? Yes. Oh, shoo. Thank heavens. Um, a Visit Portland. Portland as an international and domestic travel destination. And then we have Dinah Minot, who is the Executive Director of Creative Portland. It's a creative community. It's the fine arts, the music, everything, literary arts, graphic design, culinary arts, you can do the whole list on your own, that sustains and grows the creative economy. And there's been a lot of work done just in the last decade to specifically point that out and help the city grow with that. So I am going to turn it over to you all. And you each have 10 minutes. I'll start waving at you if you go over 10 minutes. Uh, and when you're all done, we'll go to Q&A. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. So it looks like I'm first on the agenda. Um, as you said, I'm Casey Gilbert, Executive Director of Portland Downtown. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what Portland Downtown is and what we do to keep Portland vibrant. But I thought it would be fun first just to share a little bit about who I am so you can get to know me a little bit. Um, so I raised my hand in the beginning when they asked, you know, did you grow up in Maine? Um, and I grew up in New Hampshire, so I'm a Granite Stater. I was born in Laconia and um, stayed there for most of my life until I graduated and went to the University of Vermont in Burlington, which is another beautifully vibrant city. Yeah, Burlington. So I went to UVM and my degree was community development and applied economics. So I think I knew I was going to be in downtown economic development before I even knew it. There was something um, in my heart that was um, always drawn to economics and downtown vitality. I did my graduate degree at Carnegie Mellon University, which is in Pittsburgh, but I've actually never been to Pittsburgh. Um, Carnegie Mellon opened a satellite university in Australia, so I did my degree in Adelaide, and I have a master's in public policy and management. And then I'm actually, um, in addition to working full-time for Portland Downtown, I'm doing my PhD program um, at the University of Southern Maine right now in public policy, so kind of sticking with the same vein. Um, and I really fell in love with downtowns when I started volunteering with Main Street programs more than a decade ago. I started volunteering with Main Street programs in New Hampshire and then in Florida, and then I was lucky to land my dream job here in Portland. Um, I not only love Portland, I eat, sleep, and breathe Portland. Um, I do not work a 40-hour-a-week job. It is, you know, with me all the time. Um, so I love Portland, and I love my job, and I'm so excited to be here to talk with you about Portland today. Um, I thought it would also be kind of fun just as a show of hands. So we rebranded. We used to be called Portland's Downtown District, which is quite a mouthful. So just by a show of hands, how many of you before today had heard of Portland's Downtown District or Portland Downtown? That's good. And with that show of hands, how many of you feel like you kind of know what Portland Downtown does? Okay, a few less hands, okay. And then finally, how many of you know the term business improvement district? Is that something you? Okay, good. So we're gonna demystify all of this today. Um, so Portland Downtown is a 501c4 nonprofit business improvement district. And we're actually bound by a geography, and I brought my PowerPoint today. And it's on a foam core board. <laughs> um, so can everybody see that over there? Okay, in here. So we're kind of bound by essentially Commercial Street and then Cumberland Avenue, which is right behind Congress Street, and then Franklin Arterial, and that way down there, that's Longfellow Square. And so that's kind of our boundaries. Um, we were established in 1992, and um, Lynn, before the presentation, said, you know, you should kind of tell them why 
you know, you came to existence. And I wasn't in Portland, of course, so a lot of what I'm telling you is anecdotal and historic information, but downtown Portland was kind of, you know, hit by hard times. And Congress Street had a lot of storefront vacancies. Um, the old port, um, as I've heard from stories, was not a place you wanted to be at night. Um, and so business improvement districts a lot of time get formed because they need an entity that can come in and bring vitality to the downtown. They need people to get together and make a plan, a strategic plan, for how they're going to spur economic development in a downtown. And so that's why Portland's downtown district was formed in 1992. Um, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the structure of the organization. So we have four full-time staff that work in the office. I'm the executive director. We have an office manager. We have a marketing and communications coordinator. And Amy Guerin is here somewhere today. She is my downtown experience liaison. And then we employ five full-time public works crew to work on our clean and safe initiatives. So when you see people out keeping the streets clean, when you see the parking bans declared and all the snow magically gets trucked out of downtown, we're doing that and we're paying for that. Um, the supplemental tax is levied on all of the property owners within that district, so that's how we get funded. Um, they get their typical tax bill from the city of Portland, and then they get an additional tax bill, a supplemental tax bill, and that goes to fund our nonprofit business improvement district. And when I say nonprofit, I mean we have a board of directors that represent the diverse mix of um, stakeholders in the community. So we have a residential representative on our board, we have a retail representative on our board, we have a nightlife representative on our board. So really hearing from the broad base of the constituency. And we all work together on a five-year strategic plan, which we're in the midst of right now. And I look out in the crowd and I see Matt Veith, who is one of our board of directors from Machaya Savings Bank. Um, so I can look out in the community and see people who are affecting change in our organization all the time. And that makes me really excited. Um, so within our five-year strategic plan, Tuck kind of pointed out these six areas. We have four, which is vitality, experience, growth, and advocacy. And we work um, on goals underneath all of those strategic areas. And I think some of the things that we're most proud of that we've been working on with advocacy, and um, Tuck and Bill both pointed to me earlier and said she can talk about parking and wayfinding. Um, we collaborated with the city on a parking uh, advocacy letter that was a list of recommendations. And one of those was that we needed to do a parking study for downtown and the waterfront. So we chipped in $15,000 to the parking study, um, and hopefully that report will be coming out soon, looking at the existing supply and demand of parking in downtown and the eastern waterfront, projecting and predicting future supply and demand, and what we need to do to manage that supply and demand. So I think there was a question from the audience earlier around what are we doing to look at parking and transportation. So one of our advocacy issues was parking, and another was sound. In a developing city, you have, you're bringing in more residential development, but you also want a vibrant nightlife community. And how do those two work together? So we also did another advocacy letter around sound. And something that came from that is that we now have uh, monthly public meetings at the city of Portland. Um, the Sound Oversight Committee meets once a month and hears from the public about their concerns around sound in downtown. So we're really um, an advocacy organization. We're keeping downtown clean and safe, and we're also marketing it. During your lunch break, you can come over to our table and see the beautiful directory that we produce. Um, and a lot of people first come to know Portland downtown through our major events. Have you guys ever heard of the Old Port Festival or Merry Madness? Yes, we have to manage that behemoth of an event. Uh, something that we inherited as an organization, but um, you know, part of our strategic look at these events over the coming years is how can we make those events better work for our local community? I think with the Old Port Festival, it's something that's kind of grown out of control over the years and may not necessarily serve our local community the, the best way that it could, so we're going to be looking at that over the coming years. Um, so I talked a little bit about our board, our staff, our public works crew, we have active committees, a strategic plan, and we also have strategic partnerships. And I'm sitting with some of those folks here today. So Lynn from Visit Portland, Dinah Minot from Creative Portland, and the City of Portland, we all work together on what's called the Economic Development Stakeholders Committee. 
a lot of people talk about silos, and we want to make sure that we break down those silos. And a lot of people say, are you the chamber? Are you the Convention and Visitors Bureau? Quincy is here from the chamber as well, another one of our strategic partners. And we all get together to make sure that we're not overlapping and stepping on each other's toes, and that we're also working strategically together. So the city of Portland houses the Economic Development Stakeholders Committee, and we all sit together and talk about what we're doing to make downtown vibrant. So I can say that from 1992 till now, that's 25 years that Portland downtown has been in existence. We've come from a downtown which had a super high vacancy rate in storefronts, property values were down, there was not a lot of um, you know, vibrancy happening here, and with the help of our partners, the city, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, Visit Portland, and all these other organizations, you can see that we have this beautifully vibrant community. And I just came back from California for a conference, and everybody I talked to out there was like, oh, you live in Portland, Maine? I love that place. You know, I vacation there, or my grandmother lives there, I go visit her in the summer, we honeymoon there, I bring our kids there. We are talked about not just nationally, but globally right now. We're on all the top 10 lists. Um, and the theme that I was speaking on at the conference, and it'll be the theme of our, downtown, our international downtown conference next year, is authenticity. And that was, interestingly, one of the points that Tuck brought up earlier that was part of the comprehensive plan of Portland. And it's something that downtowns and cities are struggling with across the nation and across the globe, is as we grow and as we change, how do we preserve that which makes us authentic? How do we keep our artists? How do we keep our working waterfront? How do we keep Portland vibrant and authentic while we grow? And so it's a really interesting conversation that we're having as a downtown organization with other downtown organizations across the nation. So I'm just gonna look at my notes here and see what else I wanted to say before I hand it. Um, so I think I wanna cover just a couple of things um, before I hand off. Um, one is really that we, they, we talked a lot about data earlier and Portland downtown is also evolving to try to be a more data-driven organization. Uh, no longer is it let's just throw something at the wall and see what sticks. I want to know, are my public services crew and my public works crew being effective? Are they delivering the services and the ROI that our stakeholders expect? If that property owner is paying their tax bill to us, are we delivering back to them something far above what they could have got if they just paid for that service themselves? So there's this power in this collective organization where we can pool our resources and make sure that those resources are used in downtown. Um, and so tracking that and then proving that back to our stakeholders is, is hugely important. And one of our challenges, and I bet that my friend Lynn and Dinah can speak to this as well, but there's infinite needs on a finite budget. Our budget is only $800,000 a year and most of that is in labor for our staff, um, the people in our office and our public works crew. And it's graffiti, it's public restrooms, it's parking, it's sound. I mean, I think probably if I look out into the audience, you probably all have your own passion project for what you'd like to see in downtown. Flowers and banners and cleaning up cigarette butts and we have to do this all with finite time and finite resources, but I think we do it really well. Um, I hope you see that reflected out in the community and know that we're working hard every day, our board of directors, our staff, um, our public works crew, to make downtown the best experience that it can be. Um, so I think with that, I haven't got the hook yet, but I feel like I'm coming up on that time. Um, and as I said, I can talk the leg off a chair. So if anyone wants to continue the conversation with me about Portland downtown afterwards, I've got business cards and I would just welcome uh, the conversation anytime. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Lynn. Okay. Okay. All right, we'll keep going because we all work together really closely. So I think the format was to wait for questions because we'll all interject together. So my name is Lynn Tillotson. I am the president and CEO of the Greater Portland Convention and Visitors Bureau. Our primary role is to market the Greater Portland region, which goes from Freeport to Scarborough and includes Westbrook and Gorham for tourism. That would involve um, leisure travelers, international travelers, motor coach business, uh, the cruise ships, 
sporting events, meetings and conferences, destination weddings, and we host media as well. So the difference that, that we are between the chamber is the chamber really focuses on economic development through businesses coming into the area, and we focus on economic development through tourism coming to the area. Um, we're a membership-based organization. Most convention and visitors bureaus are funded by a portion of lodging taxes across the United States. Maine does not have an optional lodging tax. So we're membership funded. The members are the ones that help us market this destination. Everyone is pooling their resources together to allow us to go out of state to market Greater Portland. Um, Maine has about 36 million visitors that come into the greater Por into the state. Greater Portland has about six million that visit us specifically here. Now the interesting thing with that is we partner with the Office of Tourism on some research and the question on that survey is what was your primary destination? So six million people have said that Greater Portland is their primary destination. So that doesn't include all the people who are going into the beaches region, they're coming here for the day or having dinner, or they're passing through, stopping by as they go to the mid coast or the down east region. So 6, 000, 6 million people is incredibly conservative. So it's one of the things that we really work towards with the city and um, our community partners is making sure that when we're thinking about growing Portland and growing our region, that we're growing it to, to keep attracting visitors. It's still our number one industry. We need to protect it and respect it and be welcoming to them. There are many other destinations in the world, let alone in this amazing state that they could visit if we don't start taking care of them. But it's, it's considering as we're growing, are we thinking about the impact for them as well. If we're doing a study about um, bike paths, we mentioned bike paths early, that's important, but are we going to take away some of the streets in order to take care of bikes and then six million people are really getting congested? So it's just taking a look at everything if we're doing studies that we're thinking about the residents and we're thinking about the visitors as well. Um, let's see as we're doing our theme with show of hands. How about a show of hands for anyone who either works in the tourism industry, has family or friends in the tourist industry, or colleagues in the tourism industry? Over there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of our number one job opportunities in the state. So we're, we're very on top of that, really working with our partners with Live, Work in Maine, if you're familiar with them, about growing the workforce. Um, that's a really big need for, of ours. Uh, let me see, what else can I think of? One of the things that we're talking about with um, tourism is really making sure that we're staying authentic as well. I travel all over the United States and the world, all of my staff does as well, and we're marketing this area. And as Casey said, that many people have this vision of Maine and they hear Portland and they're always like, oh my gosh, I hear it's, it's so beautiful, I want to go there. Well, the reason why they say that is because they have this picture in their head and it's, it's pristine and it's, it has a mystique to it and we have to protect that. But it's also one of the things that I promote all the time is our working waterfront. We're authentic. Traveling all over the place, you've probably gone there, there's cookie cutter strip malls everywhere. And we come home and we're like, oh, wow, it's so amazing. So keeping our working waterfront is incredibly vibrant. It, it has to stay vibrant and authentic to continue to attract tourism as well. Um, let's see, working with our partners, um, people obviously will confuse uh, Portland downtown with what we do. So the analogy that I use is we're out of state marketing this area. We're bringing the visitors in. Once we bring, bring them in, it's up to 
Casey and her crew to make them happy, give them events, keep the streets clean and safe. So they're taking care of people while they're here, but it's our job to bring them here. That's probably it in a nutshell. I mean, I could go on and on about how we market to each of the different segments, but that's a whole nother long presentation. So I'm gonna hand right. it over to Dinah with Creative Portland. Hi, I'm Dinah, and I'm more of a newcomer than these two. Um, although I did grow up coming to Maine my whole life, to the island of North Haven with my family and um, ancestors that go way back. Um, but I've been all over the world. I've spent a lot of time in Europe, in China, in Los Angeles, New York, and my husband and I chose Portland to settle in because um, we liked the people, we liked the sea air, and we wanted a lifestyle that wasn't so sort of frantic, competitive, and, um, you know, chaotic, really. I mean, especially when you've been living in Los Angeles and dealing with the traffic and the problems there, not to mention earthquakes and drought and all the other <laughs> problems <laughs> that you try to survive. Um, I feel very lucky how simple it is. You know, the biggest problem is finding a parking space, you know. So um, I'm very grateful to be here. And uh, my background, uh, I also went to UVM, a little before Casey did. And um, I studied art history and art education. And so I too have been passionate about the arts my whole life. I'm from a family of artists and writers. Um, we all create art and what I found fascinating, um, and it's very evident here in Portland, is that is sort of in my generation, we used to uh, kind of label our, ourselves, or as artists, one's a photographer, one's a printmaker, one's a musician, you know, you had your own niche or specific area of talent. And uh, my children who were, you know, at, some are in college and, and out of college, uh, very much uh, reinforce the notion that those labels are fading and and we have you know musicians poets and painters as well as web designers photographers you know everyone's a photographer now on their iPhone but um, I find that fascinating and relevant because um, there is such a crossover and it is much more fluid and um, the arts and self-expression is uh, so prevalent and, and it's so accessible to all of us now that there's more of an interest in engagement and participation. Uh, donors are moving more towards philanthropy in the arts and recognizing the value of how arts and cultural organizations um, contribute to the creative economy. And really without those different groups um, that I think, I mean, we all know the economy would tank. I mean, who wants to go to a town where there's nothing to do that's fun or interesting? And because the foodie business has really taken off here um, and the restaurants are, are, are so sought after, um, we have more people willing to go out at night, which is kind of a new thing for Mainers. I'm finding, as I talk to more and more people, everyone's always like, what are you, you're going out again tonight? You know, what's with you? And, you know, I think it's normal, you know, but, um, you know, apparently in the winter here, no one ever wants to go out. So I have some friends who have been living here their whole life that um, I've known when I was a child, and they said, you've gotten me out more in the last three months than I have been out in 20 years. <laughs> so um, anyway, enough about that. I am happy to be Executive Director of Creative Portland. We were founded uh, by a city TIF in 2008 as a merger between PACA, which was uh, the Portland Arts and Cultural Alliance, and a Creative Economy Steering Committee report, which um, really formed a work plan that created Creative Portland as a quasi-municipal organization and a 501c3 nonprofit. So we have up to 21 board members, which, you know, I, I'm weighing the pros and cons of that right now in terms of, you know, board cultivation and, 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 
and, and really kidding aside, you know, wanting and needing a lean, mean working machine, you know, with feet on the ground and hands on the table because unlike these guys who, you know, are in my mind wealthy, you know, <laughs> we are, um, <laughs> we're a nonprofit <laughs> with a budget less than 200 grand. We, comp we have no membership. Um, we, are, we rely on donations and grants and with the NEA and, you know, Peril, this is, this is a big deal, you know. So we are going to be reaching out to the community and to corporate sponsors. And um, I will be extending my reach to national sponsors as well because um, I, I think there's an opportunity there. We haven't uh, really gone out to those people who will benefit from um, Portland and Maine. I mean, we are a go-to destination. I mean, not, not just in the summer, but in the winter as well. And if we create something exciting with all of our partners, whether it's a Northern Lights Music and Arts Festival or something, you know, all the organizations and all of our stakeholders can be involved in that. And, and we don't just have to do it with arts and cultural you know, fledgling organizations, we can reach out to L.L. Bean and Thompson's Point and all others and create a big splash for Portland that puts us on the map, you know, beyond our immediate, you know, peninsula. We, we want to make a big effort to stretch out and go beyond into greater Portland and into all the districts of Portland, especially in some of our current programs, which I'm going to get to in a minute. But um, so that gives you an idea of how we were formed and who we are. And up to now, since 2008, from all the minutes I've read and from the interviews I've had, and I, I off, I, I'm not kidding, I have like 20 meetings a week. You know, that's how, how busy I'm sort of on information overload. So if I don't know your name, you know, forgive me. I, I used to think I had a great memory, but now it's like, what? You know? Um, but um, I will say that, uh, you know, we are here to forge relationships and um, to facilitate partnerships and to convene groups that may have not have gotten together before that will benefit from being together just to talk and, you know, and connecting. You cannot underestimate the value of connectivity and networking. And I've been very blessed to be part of the Omega class with Lyft 360. And um, we are graduating next Friday. And there's Jane, who's on my team. And um, that's been a wonderful experience, too, because I, I, I came to Portland with a, with a passion for um, wanting to celebrate diversity and to really um, acknowledge our differences here and to be proud of those differences. And I was kind of shocked coming from a culturally diverse and, uh, you know, city, Los Angeles, to find how segregated we are today in 2017. And, um, you know, part of that, it just takes time, but so much of it is about exposure and um, really spreading awareness. And if we give more opportunities to uh, integrate um, all the different communities that exist, you know, into our arts and cultural organizations, in leadership positions, on boards, and to use the arts to spread that messaging we're going to be in a much better position to, you know, work together. Because the more we share, the more we trust each other. The more we trust each other, the more likely we are going to want to collaborate and, um, and problem solve together. And then that really uh, creates productivity, I think. Um, okay, so what kind of partnerships would we create? Well, uh, we might do something, I, I can't speak about specifics right now because we really are in development stages. So, um, and let me just back up one second. We are initiating a citywide cultural plan because we, we need to update the 1998 cultural plan. That's the last time it was done. And so we're gonna rely on the stakeholders, you know, private, public, and nonprofit constituents and stakeholders to tell us, you know, what the gaps are, what your, your barriers, boundaries, uh, obstacles are for success. And it really comes down to who you're talking to. So if you're in a small, you know, group of, you know, big guns, 
let's call them the arts and culture, you know, giants in Portland, the, the, the PMA, PSO, PO, P State, I mean, I, I'm sort of joking, but do you know, are you following me? Um, Portland Stage, Portland Ovation, um, Portland Symphony, Portland Museum of Art, as well as the Maine Historical Society, Portland Public Library, uh, Mecca, and USM. Those I consider to be the big guns. So I, I said, well, let's all get together and discuss some of these issues. You know, what? You know, what do you mean? You know, so we got together, all eight of us, who were at the table, they said, for the first time, just them all together, to discuss some of the issues that they're dealing with. And they're in a whole different league than the fledgling organizations and the artists who I got together with later, who work in silos and don't have the privilege of, um, you know, having a network or seeing each other at events. They're they're just trying to get by or and and deal with their limited capacity and their hard work to um, exist. But you know, my feeling was let's find out how we can you know coordinate together. So as an example. When um, I brought the artists together, and I have to say a third of them, of the two dozen, were people of color, which was unusual for this group for some reason. Um, and I thought, I assumed everyone might know each other because they were really legitimate, you know, accomplished artists we're talking about. You know, some, you know, the Aaron Steffens and Andy Rosens and, you know, the, the main players in um, Portland. And one guy, who created that um, sculpture. It, it's a uh, sort of steel ribbon. It's in the ceiling of Pai Men Miyake, you know, across from one Longfellow. He, um, I loved his sculpture, so I asked Hans, the manager, you know, who is this guy? And I thought he was some old timer. Oh, he's local, Portland. And it turns out he's a 28 year old kid, you know, who's just amazing. And um, I brought him to this meeting, and he met another guy, Ebenezer Acapo, who's doing um, 3D printing uh, on wood laminates to create bracelets and so forth. They found out that they both use 3D, 2D machines. Ebenezer didn't have one. Uh, uh, Nelson has a uh, water cutter in his studio in gray. Please come use it any time, you know, and so on and so Anyway, it's really cool because they were all just realizing we need to do this more often. We have no place to go. And that's what Creative Portland needs to be. We need to be, uh, you know, a, an advocacy organization and uh, to be in a pivotal place to nurture and support these organizations that need help that need help because there's no housing, there's no studio space available, it's not affordable, they um, don't have the capacity to market themselves, they can't afford to create their own you know, websites and or need help to do that. So again, what can we do to help? We're, we're lucky because our only charge is to help people. I mean, meaning that, um, we, everyone else has their own business that they have to do. And, and we're here to say, how can we help you? How can we convene and, and support you? Do you need more professional development? Should we create a resource center where you can come in and have pro bono legal advice and, and figure out how to form a 501c3? Or how to get a fiscal sponsor? Us, we'll be your fiscal sponsor. We have the liberty of being a 501c3 so we can receive grants and donations, re-grant, and or just process your donations. So um, I feel so excited about the opportunities ahead for Creative Portland. Um, and I, I don't want to go down the path of, you know, why haven't you done this before? I mean, why haven't we done it before? Because we've been establishing a place at the table to be relevant. And we have um, shown and proved to the city that um, we too have a voice and we too represent a constituent that is valuable and vital to our economy. And um, we have two board members um, from the city. One is a city council member and one is from the Office of Economic Development. And so we work closely with them. And no one's out to fool anybody. You know, we're, we're here to help people. I mean, really. And um, we have programs that you guys have probably heard about as well, like First Friday Art Walk, 
which kind of runs itself because we've set up a format where, where organizations can upload their own listings and, and um, get the venues listed in our tabloid, which we print, which we pay for. You know, yeah, we have sponsors, some are in the room, like Luminato here, who, who help us um, to be able to do these things. But we have no operating budget. You know, I'm not here to beg, borrow, and steal, but we need money. <laughs> and um, we, uh, we also do Two Degrees program, which is a connectivity networking program, which is here to be a welcome wagon for people that are moving to Portland and for people who are here and again, are working alone, you know, and want to connect and be with other people. And Casey can tell you her experience. She, she's one of our testimonials for, for Two Degrees. And we also are um, booking or providing artists for the new Arts in the Chamber series, which Jill has seen, and that's an array of um, a diverse group of artists we bring in, whether they are poets, musicians, interpretive dance artists, or, uh, uh, or all sorts of um, people to showcase Portland's talent. And what we need to, from you, and what we need to spread awareness of is that we want and encourage your engagement, your participation as a volunteer. Now that we have a new street presence on 84 Free Street, right across from the back entrance of Mecca, we welcome you to come in and see that we are a legit art gallery and exhibition space. We want to showcase emerging artists. We have a bunch of established and emerging artists in there now, representing diversity in Portland. And all the work is for sale. We want you to come in and look at the art. We want to expose you to the art. I find a lot of people come into the room and sit down at the table to a meeting and they don't look at the art. You know, what does that mean? That's new for me from where I come, you know, where I've been. People come in when there's art and they look at the art. So, you know, it, it, it's exposure, I think, in many ways. Um, anyway, I, you know, I don't know if I'm at my time, but we have... You're about to get the hook. I, I'm ready to go, and I, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, our priority is to... To, to nurture and take care of you and be a fiscal sponsor if you need us. Uh, we now have what should be a fairly ample time for some Q&A. Uh, and I, I liked Jill's breaking it up into quarters. And I think I will do the same thing. And we'll, but we'll be able to run through that a whole number of times. And do you want to add anything before we launch? I think uh, uh, Pam tried to remind you to say, say your name. Uh, also, I'm wondering if, this, if it's a good opportunity for some of you, if you're comfortable with it, to uh, throw in what your two and three words were. Sure. We would welcome that as well. The first hand I saw was right here, and I'm going to do that, and then we're going to do quarter by quarter, and we'll keep going. Do not let Susan ask a question. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> I'm just teasing you, Susan. All right, I'll stand up. I'll see if I can model this well. Um, my name is Susan Morris. My day job is that I am a condominium developer here in Portland. My company is New Height Group. Um, uh, we, we will be most evident to you at this point in time if you headed out the door, took a right to Franklin, and looked left, you will see a six-story building going up called Luminato. That is 24 condominiums um, that will be completed in August, and we pride ourselves on providing housing at all different price points and design for the city of Portland. My themes, um, it is actually the vision of our company, which is that we see ourselves as being true players. We're a sponsor here today, and I think we've sponsored something with everyone sitting up uh, up here. Yeah, that's a razor, whatever. Um, but we are very committed to supporting the arts. We're um, very committed to building community, and we're very committed to helping grow Maine's economy. Everyone here can relate to that. We are trying to really be active in that area. Hopefully that is the kind of thing to, for an introduction. I have a very big thought to throw on out, and I'm sorry, I think Bill just left the room, and I think Tuck has departed as well, but Quincy, I would throw you um, in in this conversation as well. 
Um, and it is that I see the lines blurring uh, within what is truly Portland. And Casey, you held up that lovely visual, and it has boundaries around it. And I'm wondering if the day has come to stop defining Portland downtown is Portland downtown. You see, Casey, and I'm not trying to blow up your job. I was going to give you a huge promotion, but now that you have made it a shot at me, I'm not so sure. But what I'm thinking about is um, we have various stakeholder groups in Portland and Greater Portland. We've got the people that live here, we've got the people that work here, we've got the people that visit here, we've got the people that own businesses here. And we seem to still define ourselves as the waterfront, the arts district, uh, where you go to find the restaurants, etc. And I'm looking at the city expanding along the waterfront and out Daring, and I'm looking where everyone is located and where restaurants are in the East End and the West End, and where the density of growth in residential is growing. So I guess the question I have for the three of you is what is your vision, um, and, and as I say, Quincy, and I would have thrown this out to Bill and Tuck as well, is how are we thinking big about do we want to blow up this idea or redefine what our neighborhoods are? India Street just got defined two years ago. Last week, two people referred to India Street North. I mean, on the one hand, here we are, 65,000 people. <laughs> And we, we are defining ourselves into these microcosms of, of neighborhoods. So I'm just curious how you, for each of your stakeholders, would like us to define Portland. And of course, the other integral question to that is, how would it ever be funded? Can we blow up the funding, or what would it look like? So thank you. I will try to limit my questions, but I can't promise the rest of the day, because I know I am known to be a microphone hound. <laughs> Thank you, Susan, and I hope everyone knows I was kidding. Um, Susan is the, one of the biggest movers and shakers in this community, and she does truly love, and she puts her heart and soul into everything, and I'm glad to have you here asking questions, so thank you. That's a tough, right, that's a tough question to, to wrap your mind around, and I would answer that from a couple of different angles, and then, of course, I'll pass it on to Lynn and Dinah to chime in as well. Um, Portland downtown as a business improvement district has to have geographic boundaries just because that's how a business improvement district is set up. We need to be able to tax you somehow. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, I think it's good to have neighborhoods. I think it's good to have different sections of Portland that have different identities. Um, and again, speaking of going to this conference out in California, Every community kind of struggles with this notion of where do we begin and end as a community? What are those boundaries? And if we're an organization that's supposed to be specifically promoting a certain section, where do we stop? And are we going to say, no, we only promote downtown, we're not going to promote all of Portland? And I think, you know, the CVB and I have gone back and forth on this too when we talk about tourism and tourists coming in and visitors coming into town. Because we're Portland downtown, are we going to say, we're not going to tell you any of the restaurants to go to in the West End because they're not in downtown? No, we're promoting this beautiful, wide ranging product that is Portland. Um, we've talked about as an organization growing our geographic boundaries. Um, it requires an active city council and an act, you know, uh, changing our main state charter. Um, but I think it's a good question to ask. And I think Creative Portland originally, when that TIF was formed in 2008, one of their charges was to market Portland as a full community. We're in charge of downtown, Lynn is in charge of the region, but I think we all work in tandem. Um, so I think in between the comprehensive plan, our strategic plan, everybody working together, we do blur the boundaries of where does Portland begin and end. Um, and so I think we're all working together to recognize that Portland is bigger than just downtown in the old port. Um, so I hope that answers your question. And I did just want to touch on one thing that I didn't mention in my presentation, but um, our partnership with the city is integral to making this work. I know a lot of people think that, oh, the city, things get over there and they get held up and they're really making it happen. And I can speak to all of our organizations have to work in tandem and really well with everyone at the city, our city councilors, the staff, the city manager to make things happen. And we have a really well-functioning city and we have a city that cares. Your city councilors care about Portland, the staff cares about Portland, your city manager's making it happen. So I just wanted to say that before I hand it off. So Lynn, what are your thoughts on 
Portland and how big it is and how big we need to make it. <laughs> you need to be on radio. So it's interesting, <laughs> right? <laughs> or TV or something. Um, it's interesting because when visitors think about coming to the area, they're thinking about they hear Portland. They don't know the differences between Portland and Scarborough or, or you know, that sort of thing. But when they get here, we really market the differences that are happening. Each community or, or even each neighborhood within Portland has a different feel to it. The people are different. The shops or the restaurants are different. There's a different vibe in each of those communities. And it's good to embrace that, and the visitors really like to experience all of that. So I think it's okay to have those little communities, but what we really need to work on is internally, our communities working together. I'm trying to work really closely with many of the other communities and their city managers and, and mayors and city councils to let them know that we're all in this together. It really isn't just Portland, although Portland is a, certainly a, a draw for visitors. It's all of us working together. They're gonna come and they're gonna spend time at the beaches in Scarborough and they're gonna go to Freeport. They're gonna do, um, you know, hike the mountain in Pownall. It really is everywhere. We can't say that visitors are gonna just come to Portland and never leave Portland. It's not gonna happen. So it's working collaboratively. Yes, I do. Um, Creative Portland has been charged, uh, you know, by the Office of Economic Development and the Work Plan, to be the lead agency to market and brand Portland, and we have not done that yet. Um, we've had initiatives where we try to consolidate and come up with a slogan that we could at least work with in terms of um, having consistent branding, and it started out being yes. Life is good here. And um, that worked for a nanosecond uh, <laughs> I, I, until uh, new executive directors came in and changed their Portland downtown, changed theirs to, you know, eat, pray, love. <laughs> eat, shop, stay, play. <laughs> and uh, the Convention and Visitors Bureau changed theirs to uh, Portland, authentic by nature. You know, we at Creative Portland are keeping it salty. You know, so anyway, <laughs> we, we'll, we'll see where we end up with that. But what I wanted to say is that um, I've been very surprised learning from many arts organizations that um, their rooms are often empty in the summer. And I'm like, why? What? You know, you've got a gazillion tourists coming into town. Well, you know, the tourists are going to the old port and, and, and down to the streets where all the shops are. And maybe we're going to do a better job now of marketing the arts um, to tourists. We're going to work with the uh, State Tourism Bureau and with Lynn. And we are going to create um, art tours and we're going to create accessibility for, um, for the uh, tourists who are coming in who don't you know, know what's going on in the arts. And I don't just mean the big guns again. You know, Portland Ovations and Symphony, they have amazing, uh, you know, talent that they're showcasing of talent that comes from out of town. You know, we have a lot of talent here in Portland and, and Thompson's Point is brewing with all sorts of activity, um, with the Children's Museum moving down there soon and with concerts there throughout the summer and a, you know, incredibly beautiful venue. Uh, we, we're going to, we're, we're really going to promote that and push that in the future after we get the cultural plan done um, and validate that this is what people want. Um, so that, that's what we're going to do in terms of Greater Portland. Great. I'm going to give Jill the microphone for a minute. It's hard for me to just moderate. Uh, with your indulgence, I'd like to just add a few comments. And one is I wanted to reference us back to the new comprehensive plan in a major part of that is uh, the notion of um, promoting other neighborhoods in Portland mm -hmm. and uh, promoting growth and density off peninsula so that, for example, um, in Deering Center, uh, there's a lovely neighborhood there with uh, Pat's Meat Market. Um, <laughs> I go there for my bacon. Um, there's uh, 
there's uh, Woodford's Corner, which has a couple of new restaurants and is at the uh, beginning of a whole uh, development there. Um, Libby Town. Um, and then, of course, we, we, we in North Deering um, leak over to Westbrook where there's a lot going on yeah. and in the greater Portland kind of sense. And folks downtown leak over to SOPO. Um, and so there's a lot going on both artistically and uh, in the music venue and all those things. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is this notion of Portland as a hub, um, that we should take advantage of that. People are coming to Portland, but we should be, I think, and through these organizations we are, uh, part of promoting people. If, if Portland is your main place you're coming, but get out to the rest of this rest of the state. If you buy a piece of pottery on Exchange Street, um, why not encourage that person to go out to Georgetown where, where the pottery is made? Um, if you buy a lamb's wool sweater, why not encourage that person to go up to Bethel where the lambs are, where the wool is grown? Um, and so we can be a part of helping. Um, we are a major part of the economy of the entire state, and I think we can continue to be planful about that. Um, so I just wanted to throw that in. I'm going away now. <laughs> well said. Oh, true. Thank you very much, Jill. <laughs> Jill is at the center of things, and I know how There's hard it is for you. her to, to not comment on a lot of things that are going on around here because she knows a lot about it. We are now in this quadrant. This is the first hand I saw, so I will do that. Thank you. My name's Marcia Sharp, and I'm with uh, Lyft 360. Um, Jill, you asked that we put our words into play or some other words. I, two of mine were um, vibrant and uh, waterfront. One of yours was eau de vie, or eau de fish. Um, a question that may be lurking here. We've had these two remarkable presentations about a city that has everything growing for it, going for it, growth, vibrancy, and it's bigger than a city, and, and so on. I want to get at the underside. Um, how do you, who are in the business of promoting and growing this fantastic resource, or one of our other panelists in the back of the room, how do you think about the tipping point? You must wake up at night and think, at what point do we become not so vibrant and not so authentic? And is this within our control, or do we just try to tame this engine and hope? Yeah. I'll answer that one, or at least try to say something about it. That's a really good point. I think it's part of all of us working together to making sure that we're working with the city, we're working with the regions to grow and grow responsibly and really think about making sure we're staying authentic. It is the thing that we are, it's, it's who we are, it's the core of who we are, and that needs to stay that way. Um, you know, will there be too many tourists? I don't know if we'll ever get there, really. I mean, we're, we are a bucket list destination, and we have a very, very large state, a very large, beautiful state, and a very large, beautiful region, if you think of all of New England. The motor coaches and the international market don't just come to Maine, they're traveling all of New England. So I don't know if we'll ever get to that point where we're just overrun by tourists. I think on the flip side, we have to make sure that we're protecting it to make sure tourism continues to come here and doesn't go away. Because what we have here with our community, with the arts, um, downtown, our surrounding regions, the amount of restaurants we have and hotels and, and all of the things that we have here that as locals we all enjoy and this is why we live here as well, we have to protect tourism because 68,000 people are not going to sustain what we have in this community. It's just not gonna happen. So I don't think we'll ever get to the point where we're just overrun because we're just so large, we're so vast, and because we're a bucket list destination, it's really important for us to continue to market for new tourism. I mean, there's so many places in the entire world to visit these days. The world is so accessible that anybody could pick up a magazine or go to turn on TV and see advertisements for Dubai and California and say, okay, I'm gonna hop a flight, I'm gonna go. So there's too, there's too much competition that I don't think we ever have to worry about that. We just have to worry about keeping our authenticity 
making sure we're welcoming so people do continue to come here. That's more of the concern, is making sure they continue to come here. I just want to continue in that vein, and the, the two words that really came to my mind, the first is balance. Um, and, and this was talked about a lot at the conference that I was just at around authenticity and that balance between chains and mom and pops and growth and historic preservation, right? So we've got to strike a balance. But I think Lynn is playing devil's advocate, and I like that because I was going to too, and it's we're the it thing right now, right? We're thinking, oh my God, we're going to grow and it's going to get so out of control, and that can change in a minute. Um, one of the presentations we saw in California was this guy put up some slides of ruins of old cities. And he said, they thought they were going to be the it thing for a while, and now. So he was really just calling our attention to, you know, be careful that before you grab onto that needle and try to pull it back, that you're being mindful that you want to maintain slow, consistent growth. You want to keep your residents here, your residents happy. Speaking of mobility, that was my, you know, my second um, word. People are mobile in where they can visit and where they can go, but millennials and other people can choose where they want to live. They can live anywhere. So why live in Portland? We need to provide them a place that they can see themselves moving to, staying, growing a family. We lose young people when they graduate high school. They go off to college and they, you know, some, some of them never come back. So how can we build a community that they can envision themselves either staying in or coming back to and living here? So I just think we need to be cautious and not live in that place where we're fearing growing too big, but being mindful about the balance as we grow and then trying to um, keep this place, the beautiful Portland that we love it, maintain it, and um, don't get too scared. Absolutely. That'd be my advice, Diana. I just simply wanted to say, I, I think we need to protect and preserve you know, what we've got, and we, we need to make sure there's some spaces for the arts and the cultural organizations to exist and stay here. That's a very, very serious issue. Okay, I think I'm on to this section. I remember we're doing section, but one in each section. So I will do this gentleman right here. But we do have time, so I'm going to get back. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm James Patefield. I'm here with the Mitchell Institute, but also with Port Fringe, uh, Maine's Fringe Theater Festival. Oh, good. Uh, so multiple hats. I'm going to switch back and forth between the two. <laughs> um, we'll do a pop up. Uh, but I was very, I guess I have like just a few comments, uh, but I, I was very heartened to hear what you were saying, Lynn, David Foster Wallace talks about in Consider the Lobster, which is an excellent essay that you should all read yes. about uh, Rockport, Maine, uh, that tourists are a uh, cultural hatred, but an economic imperative. Right. Um, and, and I'm glad that you keep bringing it back to this idea of balance, and especially uh, having balance be for locals and tourists, and for the big players, especially in the arts community, and the smaller players. Uh, Port Fringe, I think we would count ourselves as a smaller player. Uh, we, get, we are sort of more of a hub and a connector between uh, a lot of the bigger players because we use them as venues and we're trying to break down silos. So I'm happy to talk to all of you after about all of this. Uh, but I guess it's also these issues of as a local and as a millennial, uh, I tend to avoid the Old Port Festival like the plague. Mm -hmm. uh, or anywhere basically below Middle Street in the summer uh, because sort of the, the arts district becomes sort of the haven for locals mm -hmm. where they don't have to wait uh, two hours to get a table at a restaurant or 30 minutes to get a drink at a bar. Um, so I guess I, I wanted to bring all of those to the fore uh, as well as this need to to look out for the little guy and look out for uh, locals and make sure that artistic people and creative people who helped really make Portland a, a desirable destination are not crowded out and feel as if they are being uh, pushed out in the name of growth and development. Yep. Yeah. And I just want a couple of comments on that. One is I'm so excited that Congress Street has kind of grown and come into its own and that it is kind of like the locals main street now and where you go for happy hour after work and you see lots of business suits because once upon a time and you may have heard of my presentation earlier but that wasn't the case on congress street and it was 
vacant storefront. So now it's, you know, you got Nosh and Emilitsa and 555 and Bearded Ladies Jewel Box and LFK and I could go on and on and the State Theater and it is so vibrant now. So it is really coming to its own. So I hate to think that, you know, we avoid the old port and um, commercial street during the summer, but it's great that we have this kind of second main street now. Um, and then I'm trying to think the other uh, point that I wanted to make. Um, but yeah, I just think this coming into its own and oh, Old Port Festival. So I'm from Laconia, New Hampshire, and we have Bike Week there. I, yes, I got some reactions. So, you know, if, if you live in that city where, you know, you have a heavy tourism industry or you have these events, sometimes it does push the locals out. Like we had people who, when Bike Week would come to town, they were out, they were going on vacation for the week because they just didn't want to be there for it. Um, but you may have heard me mention earlier also, um, part of my initiatives and the board's initiatives, we had Lisa Whited come facilitate our board retreat and our board really wants to look at how can we make Old Port Festival more attractive to locals and visitors and also support our small businesses. So we've kind of recognized that it's one of those events which you love to hate and hate to love. Um, so we'll be working on that, so thank you for saying that. Only one day and not a week. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me move into this quadrant right here. Hi, um, as I trip over my bag and drop the mic. Um, I'm Liz Murley. Uh, my, three new word, my three words are our new home because as of this weekend, my husband and I will have lived here for six months. Um, so after actually living abroad for <coughs> 17 years, so we're really, we've got a learning curve. Um, and so just to be brief, I, we're having so much fun and so thrilled to be here and I could do 20 minutes on all the fabulous things. Um, so please just take that as a given. Um, I, we have, however, been shocked by the level of homelessness mm -hmm. in the downtown and I would imagine in other parts of the city as well. We're just diving in. So I guess my question to the panel or to other folks here is, um, particularly in a place that is so nurturing and empathic and welcoming, um, what is being done? How can people help? Um, you know, I've had some hilarious conversations downtown with folks who clearly are living living rough, as, as it's called in London, um, where we've been living. And then I've also had, frankly, some a little bit scary um, interactions. Um, and so I'm just wondering what's being done, how can a person help? I'm so glad that you asked that question. And I'm gonna step in because this was one of the big themes at the downtown conference. I keep referring back to that, but that's my professional conference where I hear from people all around the country in other cities and the issues that they're struggling with. And let me just reassure you that Portland is not the only place that is facing serious issues with homelessness right now. And we heard a presentation from this woman, Carrie, who's actually got a fellowship from Stanford right now to look into the root causes and how can we help as a community. And Amy Guerin, who's over there, my downtown experience liaison, is an expert in everything that's going on um, in downtown in Portland and how everyone is coming together to try to help. So bend her ear later, she's your girl. Um, but first I wanna say that there was this, uh, a two-pronged trend that happened about 20 or 30 years ago. And the first was that we started closing mental health facilities, insane asylums, and pushed everyone out onto the streets. And then the second thing that happened was that the ACLU came in and said people can have the right to refuse treatment and help. So in certain states and maybe even all over the country, if a police officer walks up to someone because they've been called and like somebody's laid out on the street, et cetera, and they go up to that person and say, do you need assistance? And they say no, they cannot help them. It'd be kidnapping if they took them, seriously. Um, but in our community, we have a myriad of resources. I'm sure you've heard of Preble Street Resource Center, and they provide a whole host of services from food to working on getting them shelter, um, trying to find them jobs and resources. We also have the Milestone Foundation, which we contribute um, $6,000 to a year. We just, in partnership with Machaya Savings Bank, raised $10,000 for them through a Shop for a Cause program. Um, and they have a program called Home Team, and they are a direct street outreach team. So they can go up to these folks because they're not police, and they can go up and find out if they need help and connect them to resources. So I assure you, um, as you've noticed, that Portland is an incredibly caring 
an amazingly sensitive community and we're doing everything that we can. Um, Housing First is another program that's very popular right now, which basically says it's really hard to stabilize someone and get them services if they don't have a place to live, but it's a challenge. And then we could go into the whole heroin epidemic and you know opiate addiction and that we only have 16 beds in the entire state for people. So this, it's a really a myriad of issues, but um, again, bend Amy's ear, but I can assure you that um, between the city of Portland, Preble Street Resource Center, Milestone Foundation, that we are doing everything that we can to help these people, and it does, it break, it's heartbreaking. It breaks my heart, and, uh, but I think Portland's doing as, as much as we can right now. But always need more people, volunteers, resources, and, and money, and lobbying at the state to jump in and help as well. <laughs> I'll add in um, for the tourism sector, it's difficult. Um, when cruise ships come in, there are, there's far more homeless or panhandling traffic that happens in the congested area. Um, people that we don't normally see on a day-to-day -day basis, they come out because it's cruise ship day. So that can be very difficult and we get a lot of comments about it. So it's something that we have to always be aware of, work with the city on. But you mentioned Congress Street being your haven when it's busy. And it's probably in not a very popular comment to say, but many people ask, why do tourists not go to Congress Street? I want them in my business. Why are they not coming up here? It's because we as a community are very comfortable. We, we know our community. We know the different types of people that are in our community. We know that it's overall very safe. When a visitor comes to a destination, they don't know that. You've said you've had some uncomfortable interactions, and that's what happens as visitors walk up towards Congress Street, the demographics change a bit, they become a little bit more uncomfortable and they turn around, and they so they stay in the, the heart of the old port. And it's unfortunate because Congress Street is an amazing street, and so we're, we're struggling with that a little bit on our side. You know, we, we we're getting comments. I, I mean, just briefly, I mean, to me, it's a drop in the bucket here. And so it depends on your lens or perspective, I suppose. Um, but I will say that, uh, uh, you know, Preble Street and Catholic Charities and Salvation Army is doing an amazing job. And, and there's only 80 people on the list for housing first right now. So it's a solvable problem. Uh, here in Portland, and we're very blessed. My name's Naomi Mayer. I, my first thing is Woodford's Corner, because I live there. Um, but it's hard not to, we've had s much broader and I think deeper questions than where I was gonna go. I'm still gonna go there. However, um, I just wanna remind everyone, when you talk about our homeless population and um, Yes, sometimes it's uncomfortable. Um, many times it's not. And um, I think that what we have to do as a community is educate. So when people come off a tourist, I mean a cruise ship, I love to have them here, that's great. It's good for our economy, we all know that. But it's up to us as a community. It's a great time to educate people coming from away because it isn't a problem just in Portland. It's a national problem. It may even be a worldwide problem. So you briefly touched on it. Educate, educate yourself, and then get in front of every educator and legislature's face to make sure that our money is going where you want it. And that's, that's a fabulous place for our tax dollars to go. So um, I just want to make that point before I narrow the conversation because I'd be remiss as a core team member of the uh, Friends of Woodford's Corner, which as several of you have mentioned, you'd be interested in it because it was just touted as our new arts area. And um, I wanted to talk to you about, you mentioned your board, the six people and kind of their focus. And I didn't hear you mention a key person a neighborhood person, because as somebody else mentioned, um, I don't even think there is a downtown Portland without Portland. 
you know, and it's not just winter, which we are really, we really go up in status during the winter, you know, go into any restaurant. And um, I love it here in the winter. It's my favorite time. And not necessarily, I'm not a skier, but because Portland's so accessible. And um, I could be on any of these uh, Chamber of Commerce stuff because I love Portland. Uh, I think Woodford Corner, not all of you know, but Forest Street, Forest Avenue or Street? I can't even remember now. Thank you, Forest Avenue is the most traveled street in Maine. Not in Portland, in Maine. It's the most trafficked street. Some days, 25,000 cars pass through uh, Forest Avenue. And um, except for the highways, it's the most trafficked a street in Maine. And so I would like to make sure that everybody keeps Forest Avenue on their radar. We have one of your chief players that you mentioned, USM, and it's crazy that we don't have this beautiful gateway into Portland because the peninsula is getting saturated. We are getting unbelievable restaurants out in our area and the unfortunate thing is in our hood, the joke is, oh, let's go out to Woodford F&B. Let's go take our life in our hands. Because yeah. you've got to cross the street. And it's really hard to cross the street there for anybody who has. The new development's going to deal with that a little bit. We have neighbor neighborhood organizations that deal with it. But I think Portland proper needs to bring, when I say us, I don't mean our neighborhood, just an element of... It, because that brings the whole community back to the center. And, uh, and I think we are, we are what makes Portland, Portland. Yeah. Just wonder. Yeah. Wait, I'd like to uh, quickly say something, Casey, before you, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, and that has to do with Woodford's Corner. We, we are focused on that, just so you know, and, and we'll be in touch with you soon. But Aaron Stefan is doing those cool sort of noodle-like, you know, light um, street lamps. Right. And um, we want to expand First Friday and, and focus on each neighborhood. We also want to do specific events in each neighborhood. We brought in board members, you know, several are from District 5, whatever. We're, we're, we're starting to branch out and we'll be focusing, as I say, on people that live here as opposed to just recruiting people from Brooklyn out here because Woodford's Corner is the new Brooklyn to Portland. But the millennials uh, are here, fabulous, mm -hmm. and they're moving where if, when they go to buy a house, they, they can't always buy on Peninsula, right. even though if you ask them, oh, yeah, I want to be on Peninsula. Everybody wants to be on Peninsula. But when they go to buy, realistically, they're coming out to our hoods, and yeah. it's great because yeah. it puts that new life there. Well, Naomi, I will try to speak to your question as best that I can and first start by saying I'm a Deering Center resident, so that is my hood. Um, I live on Fuller Street behind the high school, so yeah, I absolutely love our neighborhood, and I am one of the people who tra traffics and travels up and down Forest Ave every day, so I can speak to the fact that a lot of people are driving on Forest Avenue. Um, and I think Tuck could probably speak to the fact that um, part of the comprehensive plan is looking at different neighborhoods to develop kind of these nodes, so growth off the peninsula and really using um, new zoning uh, methods and mechanisms to encourage growth along those corridors and putting a highlight on those neighborhoods. And we, our board of directors has a resident representative that represents the interests of, it's kind of like our mini neighborhood organization. We have a resident on our board that represents all the residents of downtown. And then we work very closely with like the West End Neighborhood Association and Susan's kind of my surrogate Munjoy Hill advocate. So we work very closely with other neighborhood uh, organizations and we do have a resident representative on our board that speaks to the resident experience in downtown. But definitely considering all the neighborhoods working together. And yeah, Deering Center. Okay. That's it. Wait. My name is Joe Galley. I um, have been a resident of Maine for 10 years in the mid coast. Um, recently, I, I've just spent a lot of time in New York and I'm back and I've decided to make Portland my home. Um, you know, the adjectives, so to speak, where's my, oh, right. 
Uh, is authenticity a great energy and a tremendous balance? So I'm all about authenticity as, as a home, and I have found that in many ways. So to reiterate, the woman who's moved here six months ago, it's a beautiful place, it's got an incredible energy, and I believe there's a tremendous balance. Some of the things that um, I, I have worried about as a, as a, a coming to, to this city is the issue of diversity cultural diversity, and I'm not talking about, um, I'm talking about integration of ethnicities. Um, I think it's lacking, um, number one. I have three questions, so we can, you can take whatever you want, because <laughs> you just sit me here and I come, you know. Okay. The other question of concern I, I heard was the, the segregation of, of, of this branding thing between three agencies, mm -hmm. um, which is really odd, and the fact that there is a, that there's lack of coordination perhaps, and maybe I'm overstating that. But I didn't hear the word main arts commission, which really, uh, in any of the conversations, which really concerned me. I, I've been involved in the Midcoast with CMCA, um, and I knew I, that name ha has always come up before, but I didn't hear it in this conversation, which is really shocking. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, okay, I'm gonna start with the uh, main arts commission. I referred to the grants that we're going after, which is through the Maine Arts Commission. And they have been very supportive in giving us a $10,000 grant for the cultural plan initiative that we're working on. And we also are working in tandem with them to possibly do future art tours um, in and around Portland and beyond, extending into the rest of the state. And I work very closely with them and um, are excited about the opportunities that they're bringing in also with the Tourism Bureau, which I'm gonna ultimately bring to Lynn and Casey. But um, in terms of diversity, also a passion of mine, and um, there, there are a lot of groups forming. I'm, I'm part of Empower the Immigrant Woman, um, and I uh, just went to a conference this past weekend and a gala for that, and um, it's really, more about connecting, um, connecting, connecting. And Lift 360 is all about that and um, you know, facilitating that connectivity and networking through our Two Degrees program and creating opportunities um, to integrate diversity with cultural acceptance is our challenge. It's not just um, you know, being aware, it's about accepting and immersion and participation and really spreading a lot of awareness to the Mainers that are here already. So they can understand that the immigrants don't have an immigrant gene, you know? They're, everyone's from a different community and from a different place with different, you know, resources, traditions, cultural backgrounds, and um, we need to educate the public. And I hope we can do that through the arts. So on the tourism sector, we work with the main office of tourism very, very closely because they're the primary marketing organization for the state. They have a much larger budget than I do, so we partner with them. They have a cultural coordinator on their, um, on their staff. Her name is Abby Levin, if anybody's heard of her. She's amazing and keeps all of us connected and informed. We're working closely with... Um, Dinah and the Maine Historical Society and PMA. So it's working together for us to stay informed because we don't, we don't develop anything, we market it. So we rely um, on institutions and organizations to keep us informed so we know what to market and what's going on. I just wanted to add one quick thing also to you is that in terms of the Main Arts Commission, we, uh, Creative Portland, represents Portland on a national and regional basis. So we're part of the AFTA uh, surveys, which are doing an economic impact survey now. And Portland will be the recipient and benefit from that survey, which will come out in two months. Um, so we facilitate that process. And we also represent um, Portland and Greater Portland and Maine in uh, NEFTA, which is New England Foundation for the Arts, and are hosting a workshop at the CCX workshop in New London in June. 
Um, so we're, we all also are an advocacy group, and we are very involved with these government organizations. And we're hoping they're going to stay alive. Thanks, Dinah. And I'm just going to try to wrap up that question. Um, I think Dinah did a great job of answering your question about the Maine Arts Commission. Um, with regards to diversity, she mentioned a couple of organizations. We also have the Maine Access Immigrant Network here in Portland. And I know that the city has just established a new department um, called the Office of Economic Opportunity to work and try to integrate folks um, into the community, find them jobs, et cetera. So um, the city's just established that new department. I think they just had a job description out um, for, the, for the department head, someone to run that. So um, if you haven't applied they and you'd are, like they're to. Very, they're in the final stages about to give an offer. <laughs> Woohoo! It's closed. Okay, okay. it's closed. Don't I apply. didn't, want to, Don't I didn't want to say that yet. And then, um, oh, sorry. And the then offer no, is on the table. Nobody talked about branding, and I just, I, yeah. I want to make sure that branding. we answer all of your questions. So um, with regard to branding, you know, each of our organizations is a separate nonprofit. So we have to honor the mission. So as a nonprofit, we each have a specific mission. So I think that we need to honor that and honor that through our messaging and branding. But I did mention earlier, and I hope you caught it, but I'll revisit it again, is that we all sit together, including the chamber and with the city's economic development office on a committee called the Economic Development Stakeholders Committee. So we work together um, you know, to brand and market and communicate about our missions and goals to make sure that we don't overlap and that we're all supporting each other. So I think that kind of speaks to the branding. And um, Dinah had talked about the Yes Life's Good here. Um, we did try to make that gain traction and it was meant to, you would put in place of life's whatever. So yes, tourism's good here, or yes, the arts community is good here. Um, and, you know, they did some surveys afterwards that it wasn't super well received by the community, but um, we do work together on branding, and but we have to honor our missions separately as uh, individual organizations. So. I would like to add to that, too, actually, um, and I hear you, Casey, about honoring the missions. Um, I'm not completely aligned with with that concept because I do believe that outsiders don't know what each organization is or what each mission is, nor do they care. And oh, I hope they do care. Uh, no, I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm talking about, uh, you know, from the point of view of somebody that's just trying to get a general, you know, idea of, of what's going on. They're, they're not they're not as um, in tune with what we're doing. So we do need to present a unified uh, uh, brand, and we need to market Portland um, to benefit those people that are here and to bring other people in, and we need to do that together consistently and have solidarity, I believe. Lisa Whited, uh, my, my words are diversity, uh, youth, and community. And just quickly wanted to uh, pick up on the diversity conversation because there are some great organizations. I'm also part of Portland Empowered, which is about uh, connecting our high schools, our parents from New Mainers, and students with uh, the rest of the community. But really the opportunity for any organization in this room is to look at your board of directors and make sure you've got at least one third one third of your board should be diverse. LGBTQ, uh, color, Seriously. age diversity. We know we're an old population. So just start there because that's how the change can happen. We can talk till we're blue in the face, but we really need the people leading these organizations to represent the diversity that we want to see, the change that we want to see. Yeah, that's right. And we're getting closer with the city council. We're getting closer, okay? We Doesn't agree. Like we agree. I'm in this chunk We're in solidarity. My name is Roseanne Grafe, and I'm here as a subsidized participant from the West End Neighborhood Association. And people from those neighborhood associations like to thank Lift 360 for doing that for us. And I just wanted to make a comment, and then I have a question for Casey. One of them is, is that I've lived in Maine all my life, and if you are new here, I would urge that you go to your neighborhood association. Last time I looked on the city's website, I think there's about 24 of them. So there's one for everyone. If you don't find one in your neighborhood, you can always start one. Your city councilor will help you do that. 
but they are a really great place to meet people who can introduce you to all the ins and outs of Portland and so on. And I'll stop with my pep talk there and go to my question, Casey, is that I, lots of times, through my activities with the Neighborhood Association, have had people, met people who live downtown, who between Commercial Street and Cumberland Avenue, and say, who, who's our neighborhood organization? And I just have a question for you as to how that person, who you said is the residential representative, is chosen, and how can people get involved in that? Absolutely. Um, that person is David Packard, and he lives uh, next to Grace. And if anyone would be interested in giving feedback to him or having him be a resource, a conduit through which information flows, those residents in downtown, his email address is right on our website, portlandmaine.com. And we're really unique. I actually love the way that our board is built. We have a nomination process, and we actually have ballots that go out to all of our property owners that are voting on our seats. So it's not just a seat is empty and who wants to, you know, come on board. Um, so it's a very structured process and I believe his seat will be coming up um, in June. So we'll be accepting nominations. So if you know someone who would like to run for the resident position for Portland downtown, send them to me so that they can get nominated. Um, but David Packard is a local lawyer and a resident and a property owner. So I think he's a good representative of residents in downtown. He'd certainly be open to feedback and would you know, meet and have coffee with people. So I would say reach out to David. Um, he's the representative. And if you know somebody who's interested in running, let me know. You're welcome. Going back to the question about homelessness and diversity, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody comment about Portland as a regional service center as a unique urban environment that is very different from perhaps the average cruise ship passengers suburban yeah. reality and how how do we educate it's an opportunity it's teaching opportunity perhaps that's right and that's what i meant by lens and perspective it depends where you're from and, and what your exposure is but yes, and in terms of educating people, that's a, you know, that, that's a much bigger issue. I mean, we, we can talk to our president about that. <laughs> we went there. We went there. <coughs> we have uh, reached a point where we need to break for lunch. And I wanted to, just a couple of, you know, each of us wants to kind of make a closing comment on that. Um, actually, why don't I let you start with that? Well, two things popped as I was listening and enjoying the exchange uh, amongst all of us. Uh, one is a quick story. Now, I told you I have phrases in my head that make me remember things that I care about. Um, one is hometown tourist. And uh, during my uh, two turns as mayor, that was a focus for my uh, year of proclaiming and welcoming. Um, that we should, and I invite you all who are Portland residents, uh, to be hometown tourists. Don't be like my first husband, who, that's because I have, <laughs> but I'm because I have two ex-husbands. Um, but my first husband uh, was a New York City resident, uh, Puerto Rican, lived, uh, raised on the Upper East Side. He born and raised in New York City and had never been to the Empire State Building or the Statue of Liberty. Let's not be that. Um, so as we focused on tourism for bringing people here, let's also get out there, you know, shake ourselves out and go down to Woodford to that beautiful new restaurant or have some delicious Cajun food at the Bayou Kitchen. Um, I could go on and on about places to go. Go out and have some beer where the beer is made. I think you can actually pick your hops in the tank and then they turn it into beer for you. No, just kidding. So uh, my other point was um, on the uh, slogan, um, I, I, yeah, uh, things are good here. Things are good Didn't here. quite work. Um, but um, the one that popped in my head at the time that that was floating was Portland, period. Yes. Portland, yes. Um, says it all for me. Great. Like Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my only, because <coughs> now I'm not going to be able to talk anymore. Um, 
my only sort of thing that has stood out for me is how often people have talked about authenticity and balance and that we should keep that in the forefront of our minds as we go forward, authenticity and balance, as a way to move forward, yeah. as a way to continue um, to grow and not lose, not kill the goose that laid the golden egg uh, while we're here.